Good afternoon. Our group works in NMR methodology. And so usually when I give a talk, I'm acting as a salesman. I'm trying to convince you of why you should consider using the new methods that we've developed and uh, perhaps also convince you that our methods are better than competing methods. This afternoon, I'd like to do something a little bit different and instead talk from the point of view of a consumer advocate and tell you why Dozy is undoubtedly useful, but why it should be approached with caution. And it really comes down to the name. Diffusion ordered spectroscopy was named by Charles Johnson Jr. with a nod, of course, to the familiar armory of methods in multidimensional NMR, cozy, nosy, rosy. And this was an excellent idea from a sales point of view, but perhaps has led to quite a lot of potential users coming to grief. So why is dozy different from cozy? I'll introduce a few ideas about diffusion ordered spectroscopy, talk about the misinterpretation and over-interpretation of the experimental results we get from dozy experiments, and then have a few suggestions about how we can maybe steer clear of trouble. So here's a nice old spectrum. I, I feel a sentimental attachment to this because it was a spectrum that I measured quite early after moving to the University of Manchester in the early 1980s. And this bit just shows us a DQF cosy of six different ethyl groups. And we see very nicely that each of these ethyl groups has got methyl and two non-equivalent methylene protons. So one, two, and so on. Now we don't often pause to reflect on just how well behaved cozy is. Sure, we get a little bit of T1 noise. If we're greedy, we can get some rapid pulsing artifacts, but basically every peak is in the right place. That this cross peak is at the intersection of the methyl chemical shift in F2 and the methylene chemical shift in F1. And that's all there is to it. Cozy peaks appear in the right position. Sometimes the intensities may be out, but we can be fairly confident that if we see a cross peak in a particular place, it's because two protons are coupled. Now let's contrast this with a dozy spectrum. This is probably pretty representative of dozy spectra in print, and it looks nothing like cozy. We have here in this region of the spectrum just three different solutes, and so we should have three different diffusion coefficients that of quinine, geraniol, and camphene. And instead, we have peaks all over the place. So at first sight, this is really not terribly useful. If we compare this dozy spectrum with one measured with a pure shift technique, which is where we basically just suppress homonuclear coupling effects in order to get a nice simple spectrum, we greatly reduce spectral overlap and now we do see our signals grouped nicely according to molecular size. We've got the big quinine, the small camphene, and the in-between geranium. But even now, these peaks aren't completely lining up. You see, they're slightly out here. Uh, that one's a little bit low, that's a little bit high. In dozy, peaks don't necessarily appear in exactly the right position, and indeed we shouldn't expect them to. So what's going wrong here? Well, we need to think about what a dozy spectrum is. People often talk about dozy NMR, and I know that um, Peter Stills always used to get very irritated about this, and I have some sympathy with him. All dozy is, is a way of visualizing the effects of diffusion NMR experiments. Experiments in which we vary the amplitudes of some pulsed field gradients 
in order to vary the degree of diffusional attenuation of species with different diffusion coefficients. What we do is to measure some diffusion weighted spectra, maybe PFG, SDE, maybe one shot, whatever, measure them as a function of gradient. We're then going to fit the signal decays to theory, to the Stasekel Tanner equation, in order to extract a diffusion coefficient for each peak. And then we extend the peaks into a second dimension and we plot our peaks in 2D form to say, well, yep, yeah, TSP diffuses slowly, HDO diffuses very rapidly, choline and acetone in between. But those of us who are small molecule chemists can immediately look at that and say, yeah, I'll have one of those. That's really useful. This is a way of looking at a proton spectrum and seeing roughly how big different components of a mixture are. But notice the bit at the bottom here. We put our peaks in the diffusion domain where the diffusion coefficient D belongs, but they have widths. They have uncertainty. If we have completely random errors, then we have a Gaussian distribution of probabilities of where the peak should be. Worse, because our D comes from fitting noisy data, not only does it have an uncertainty, sigma D, which we can represent with a width, but of course the center of the Gaussian is going to be in different positions depending on the noise. And so the fundamental point here is that dozy isn't like cozy or nosy. It may come out flat in two dimensions, but these spectra are statistical constructs. They're not the result of a double Fourier transformation of experimental data. So the first problem is that we don't expect peaks to line up perfectly. So this is what you might call a typical dozy spectrum, typical as in the best you'll ever get. So even the C13 satellites on the metal line up nicely here. The average dozy spectrum really isn't that good. We saw a moment ago from our mixture of quinine, geraniol, and camphene that we had peaks that came in between the expected diffusion coefficients. So what's going wrong here? Fundamental thing we need to keep in mind is that these are statistical constructs. The dozy spectrum is only as good as our recipe for extracting an accurate diffusion coefficient from experimental data. So I guess that's the first bit of bad news about dozy. It's a pseudo 2D and not a true double Fourier transform method. And you might legitimately be worried that a slide headed the bad news has got room for quite a few more bullet points. So the next one is that we should have clear expectations of diffusion NMR data. Anything that we do is going to give us an answer that is more or less misleading. We cannot expect perfection. What we need to do is to use the tools we have available in such a way that we can extract scientifically useful, reliable data. In many ways, the tragedy of Dozy is that there is no recipe for taking an experimental signal decay as a function of gradient and inverting that to give a distribution of signal as a function of diffusion coefficient. We can't get the equivalent of GPC for looking at polymer size distributions with any degree of safety or reliability. Most of us are reliant on commercial software. Even those of us who roll our own have a clear knowledge of its limitations. There are software packages, reputable software packages out there that can give horribly misleading results. But fortunately, this means that the literature interpreting dozy data is, I think it's fair to say, significantly less reliable than much of the rest of the literature. So there are some pretty horrible things out there. 
And then finally, just to cap it all, diffusion NMR tells us about diffusion coefficients. But usually as chemists or biochemists, or even structural biologists, what we want to know about is molecular weight. We want to know about size. And the rate at which a molecule diffuses through solution effectively depends on its hydrodynamic radius. And that for a globular molecule, like a globular protein, depends on the inverse cube root of molecular mass. But even for a random coil polymer or a fully disordered protein, it's still an inverse square root. So for a big difference in molecular weight, we get a not so big difference in diffusion coefficient. And uh, then just a, a warning that if we want to make really accurate measurements, that's quite challenging. The results of diffusion NMR experiments depend on the quality of our experiments, yes, but also very much on the quality of our equipment. And of course, diffusion is a phenomenon which is very temperature sensitive. So there's not much point in being able to measure D to 1% if you can't measure T to a Kelvin or so. Okay, but it's not all doom and gloom. There's lots of good science out there. There's lots more good science to be done with DOSI. Perfectly possible to use DOSI reliably if you understand it and you know its limitations. Some, well, maybe many, of the problems are correctable. Certainly systematic sources of error as a result of um, limitations of equipment, for example, can very often be corrected. And then, as so often in science, answering a, a question depends on how we formulate that question. And if we use prior knowledge and assumptions appropriately, then we can make the best of diffusion NMR data. Right. So after all the gory warnings, how do we go about interpreting dosy data? What do we need to watch out for? Well, let's look at this problem of signal overlap that led to our initial quinine geranial camphene one-shot spectrum giving so many peaks in the wrong places. There's a fundamental difficulty with exponential phenomena. If we add two similar exponentials, what we get looks for all the world like an exponential. There's an example here of a double exponential, which is virtually indistinguishable from a triple exponential. Now, I do recommend this, this very nice old review by Stratov, which explains a lot about the difficulty of disentangling superimposed exponentials. If we have two peaks which overlap in an NMR spectrum, and we do diffusion NMR, then those signal, that composite signal will decay in a way that depends on both diffusion coefficients. It'll be a bi-exponential decay. And naively, we might say, oh, well, let's just do a bi-exponential fit. As we'll see a little bit later, unfortunately, it ain't that simple. So let's just look at some practical consequences. We're all of us used to the idea that in most NMR experiments, we measure an FID and we Fourier transform it to get a spectrum. There's a Fourier transform relationship and we can do an inverse Fourier transform to go back to the FID, occasionally useful thing to do. If we have a sample which has some particular distribution of signal strength as a function of diffusion coefficient, and we do a diffusion NMR experiment, we measure, often very accurately, a decay of signal as a function of gradient, here of gradient squared. The relationship there isn't a Fourier transform, but it's the same thing without the square root of minus one. It's a Laplace transform. And so we might reasonably think, well, what's the problem? Let's just do an inverse Laplace transform. And um, the snag is that there is no unambiguous way to do an inverse Laplace transform of data that are anything other than totally perfect. 
Electrical engineers do inverse Fourier transforms all the time with analytical functions that they're very useful for determining filter characteristics and things. But if you take noisy experimental data, then it simply isn't possible to get a reliable inverse Laplace transform. Just to illustrate this, I'll show some distributions of signal on the right and the diffusional decay on the left. So we had a fairly sharp peak here, and we got what looks pretty much like an exponential decay. OK, well, here are two reasonably different, well-resolved peaks, but there's hardly any difference in the decay. And at this point, we begin to think, oh, dear. Um, let's have a broad distribution. Again, the di differences in the decay are there, but they're tiny. A too broad And at this stage, you say, oh, dear. It really is a real problem. We've got all these different possibilities, but they're all consistent with our experimental measurement. And so one of the key things in designing experiments for dozy analysis is that we prize chemical shift resolution. We prize the ability to resolve our signals in NMR dimension or NMR dimensions, plural, above almost everything else. Because if we can separate our signals and fit them to a mono exponential, we can get good information about the diffusion coefficient. But if we have overlapping signals, we're in trouble. So what happens if signals overlap? Let's suppose that we've got two compounds. One of them's got a diffusion coefficient of 1 times 10 to the minus 10 meters squared per second, biggish molecule, kilodalton or so. Other one's a bit smaller, diffusion coefficient of 2. Here are our diffusional decays. Faster decay for the smaller molecule, A slower decay for the larger molecule B. But, you know, if I were in the teaching laboratory and uh, an undergraduate student showed me these data, I would say, yeah, that looks a pretty good exponential. Let's do dozy processing. Sure enough, what we see is that these data are really very well represented by a mono exponential even though we know that they're two different exponentials with decay constants that differ by a factor of two. And you might think, surely in our statistical process, we should get a warning. We should see that the estimated uncertainty is increased because we have different overlapping exponentials. In practice, we don't see very much increase until our diffusion coefficients are very different. So whenever we look at a basic dozy spectrum, we always have at the back of our minds the possibility that any given peak is appearing where it does in the spectrum, not because that's the diffusion coefficient of the molecule that gave rise to the peak, but because that's a compromise between the diffusion coefficients of the two or more molecules that contributed signal to that peak. So, Mono exponential fitting of two overlapping positive peaks with different d's gives us an intermediate d. You'll occasionally pe see people say that it gives you an average diffusion coefficient. Think about the process, you can see that's obviously wrong. Now this slide says positive peaks, which implies that we could have negative peaks. And yet, in most circumstances, we shouldn't get negative peaks in the dozy experiment. We're taking spectrum and we're gradually attenuating the signals in it. But there is one reason why we can easily get negative signals in practical experiments. So let's think about what happens if we have a negative signal and we get overlap. And now things are even worse. Here are, are A and B. Now we have A is slow and B is fast. Goodness knows why that was. But still, when we have one of them negative and one of them positive, when we add them up, they're a bit less like an exponential now, but they still can decay away. And sure enough, 
we actually see instead of a diffusion coefficient that's intermediate, we see that it's actually below the lower diffusion coefficient. So if we have negative signals, we can get really confusing results. Now, how could we get a negative signal from an experiment that starts with a positive spectrum? And the reason is that we're normally doing experiments in proton NMR, and protons tend to be coupled to each other. In order to get diffusion weighting, we have to have transverse magnetization to hit the gradient pulses. And whenever we have transverse magnetization, individual multiple components are dephasing. And if we use too long a delay for our encoding, longer than a millisecond or two, then we can get some J modulation. And we see a little bit of dispersion mode mixed in with the absorption mode. Oh, and I should say that the same type of changes in apparent diffusion coefficient come about from baseline errors. Early on, I mentioned that our quote, typical, I best ever, dozy spectrum had the C13 satellites lining up with the metal signal. That only happens if you've got a really good flat baseline, because even a small baseline error will result in C13 satellites appearing to diffuse more rapidly or less rapidly than their parent signal. Okay, so let's do a fairly standard experiment with just a slightly longer, slightly wider gradient pulse than normal. And we see here that where we've got our nice wide methyl multivert, we get a little bit of J modulation, so we get a little bit of negative signal. But now if this negative signal overlaps with a fairly small positive signal, we can get an apparent diffusion coefficient, which is way out. So if we see a really oddball result, it's always worth thinking, is our spectrum really purely in absorption mode? Now, fortunately, where we have J modulation, because we've been greedy with our gradient pulses, there is a way around the problem, which is to add a 45 degree purge pulse. So if we just stick a 45 degree pulse on the end to turn our dispersion mode signals into multiple quantum, then everything lines up again as well as we normally get in dosing. Okay, so let's look at uh, some real data. And we'll look at a few different ways of analyzing diffusion data. We'll look at uh, univariate types of analysis where we take each point or each peak and analyze it separately. And multivariate where we treat the data set as a whole. At the beginning, I talked about having clear ideas about constraints on our analysis about how we can use prior knowledge. So uh, here's an experimental data set. Very high signal to noise ratio, far higher than is useful. It has a little bit of overlap in it, but it's mostly pretty clean. It's been very carefully baseline corrected. And I won't have time to talk much about this today, but something that's very useful for getting good, clean diffusion results is a data processing method known as reference deconvolution. Unfortunately, it's not well impl implemented in all NMR software, but it is an excellent way of curing many sorts of systematic errors, for example, frequency drift, line shape error, um, low frequency modulations, and so on. So we use reference deconvolution a lot in DOSI to ensure that all of our spectra measured with different gradients have the same instrumental line shape. Now, if we do a standard mono-exponential fit, what sometimes called high-resolution dozy. Our basic assumption is that there's one species per peak, and therefore mono-exponential gives us the right diffusion coefficient. Now, we know that this is often wrong, but still we can make allowances for that. And so what we see here is that we get the overlapping peak giving us a diffusion coefficient, which is intermediate between that propanol and that of sucrose. And an experienced dozy spectroscopist 
faced with that quinine geranial camphile spectrum I started with, would look at it and say, oh yes, those peaks that are scattered around the diffusion coefficient, parent diffusion coefficients intermediate between those of the three solutes are arising just because of overlap. And then you go on to do the psyche idosy pure shift experiment and sure enough, they line up nicely. So overlapping peaks give us compromised diffusion coefficients. So the obvious thing here is to say, well, let's suppose that we have a maximum of two different species contributing to each peak. Then we can just do a bi-exponential fit, get out the two diffusion coefficients and everything will be fine. And uh, we do that here and we get a reasonable result. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. But our diffusion coefficients here differ by more than a factor of two. Now, if you do um, experiments with different differences, different D ratios and different signal to noise ratios, what you speedily find is that you need really good signal to noise ratio to disentangle two decays even if they're a factor of two different in diffusion coefficient. And the furthest you can get with the best possible data is typically about 30%. Now, the other really frightening thing is that if you do a bi-exponential fit on the raw data here, you actually see two diffusion coefficients for every single signal. It looks as if the whole spectrum has been doubled. And the reason for that is that it's very difficult to make a pulse field gradient coil that simultaneously has good dynamic and good static properties. If you design your gradient coil to, be, to allow you to do uh, very short beam gradient pulses, then the gradients will vary quite a lot with position. Correspondingly, if you can put up with, with a fairly slow rise and fall times, then you can get a flatter distribution of gradient as a function of position. These experimental data came from a probe with uh, good dynamic performance, but fairly poor uniformity. The gradient's about 20% weaker at the edges of the sample and in the middle. That's not uncommon, even in modern probes. Do a bi-exponential fit of those data and you get every peak doubled. So what's happened here is that we have calibrated the gradients, we've measured the variation in gradient with position, and we've adjusted the statistical Tanner equation to allow for that. It sounds complicated. You do the calibration once, that works out a set of coefficients for a power series, you store them, and then it's just standard from then on in. But if you're going to try to entangle overlapping exponentials, you need to make sure they really are exponential. Because if your gradient coil is imperfect, they won't be perfectly exponential. Okay, so pitfalls of univariate analysis. Suppose we know that we have only two, or in this case, three species present. We could try to do some sort of statistical fitting and say, well, if we know that there really are only three species there, and we know that we have good exponential decays, in other words, we've corrected for the limitations of our field gradient coil, then we can try to find out what the minimum error is if we fit our experimental data by three arbitrary spectra with three arbitrary diffusion coefficients. And there's a nice algorithm for this, which was developed by Peter Stilbs. Um, we found a, a way to make it go quite a lot quicker. So it went from core component resolved NMR to score speedy component resolved NMR, but it's basically the same idea. And if you have good data and you have a good difference in diffusion coefficient, then you can, as here, get really very nice results. And so where our signals overlapped and gave us an okay result of bi-exponential fitting and a very not okay result of mono-exponential fitting, 
score analysis, multivariate analysis, can really do very well. The snag is that real mixtures very rarely contain only a small number of components, and uh, I've never got it to work for more than four. There's one more thing about the bi-exponential fitting. I said it's very dependent on the quality, dealt with that, and the signal-to-noise ratio of the data. But these data were 25,000 to one, and provided you've a reasonably concentrated sample, that's not too challenging to get. But I said that that's far more than is useful. The reason is that the uncertainty in the signal decay that we measure is determined in part by the signal to noise ratio, how much noise there is in our fibs, and in part by how good our measurements are, in particular, how reproducible our measurements are. So uh, here's a nice one shot dosy spectrum. And if we just pick on the methyl signal here, then we can see that the uncertainty in the fitting is really nice and small here. We've got a high resolution spectrum here where the peaks are very narrow in the diffusion. Model. We can quantify this as the diffusion coefficient divided by its uncertainty. But if we plot that resolution as a function of signal to noise ratio, what we find is that really beyond about 1,500 to one for this particular data set, we don't get an improvement in resolution. And the reason is that the individual measurements themselves introduce a small amount of uncertainty. No two radio frequency pulses are absolutely identical. So signal to noise ratio is important, but there are limits to how far it will take us. But still with good data, multivariate analysis works very well. I said though that it really works best for just two or three components. Real mixtures may have many more components than that. But maybe if we were to divide our spectrum up into bits, what you might call a, a, a cut and stitch approach, then each small part of the spectrum could be treated to score analysis. And uh, that's what we call the loco dosy or local dosy method. The idea is that if we have a spectrum with many components in, if we analyze each small region of the spectrum separately and have only two or three components in each section, then we can reconstruct a very nice, fully resolved spectrum in which we manage to get all of the diffusion coefficients right and all of the spectra right. This is a, a, a weird sample. Uh, it's just a mixture of what people had lying around. Uh, I'm afraid my, my students called this the GNO sample, um, which stood for good night out with uh, uppers and uh, cigarettes and booze. Is there anything else we can do to separate spectra with multivariate analysis? Occasionally we have a problem where we have two very similar species giving us very similar spectra, but we do at least know that we've only got two species there. Something that we can do to increase the chances of separating them is to say, well, not only do we want the best fit in a least square sense. But since we know that our spectra have small differences, let's try to get a compromise best, which, which is best fit, which is pretty good at minimizing residuals, and also pretty damn good at giving different spectra. And so we construct an algorithm that values difference between our component spectra. And with a really difficult problem here, large amounts of overlap, fairly similar diffusion coefficients. Here, we can extract pretty convincing spectra. There's just enough crosstalk there, little artifact here compared with the very big metal signal there, just enough crosstalk for us to feel fairly confident that we've actually done a good job here. Okay. We're still on misinterpretation here. What else could go wrong? The dozy paradigm 
assumes that each species has a unique diffusion coefficient. And that by and large is true, but that's not true for its NMR signals. Because if we have it, signals which come from protons that are in chemical exchange, if they're exchanging with a species with different diffusion coefficient, then their diffusional decays will be different. And so if we look at this spectrum of uh, spiridin here, then we see that we've got a little bit of overlap with solvent there that we expect that. We see that all the CH signals give us very nicely lined up diffusion coefficient peaks, but the OH peaks are all at higher diffusion coefficient than we expect. And what's happening is that the OHs are exchanging with the water. Water diffuses really fast. And so even relatively slow exchange gives us a measurable effect on the apparent diffusion coefficient. So chemical exchange can be a problem. We can get around it if we need to by choosing an experiment in which instead of encoding our magnetization with position and then storing it as Z magnetization, we leave it as transverse magnetization. And that means that if we have chemical exchange, we'll get dephasing and loss of the exchanging signals. And so exchange causes signal attenuation instead of change in diffusional attenuation. And so here in this particular experiment, our OHs line up again. Of course, having exchange can be useful to us. We can actually use diffusion measurements as a way of measuring exchange rates. Here's an, uh, an old example from a collaboration with Stefan Berger, in which we measured the rates of NH proton exchange, different parts in the ubiquitin molecule. Unsurprisingly, the um, terminus has rapid exchange, but we also have rapid exchange where we have terms which are solvent exposed. Okay, enough about this interpretation. Um, what about over-interpretation? Uh, I did say that there were some things in the literature which weren't entirely correct. Uh, this is an example from a reputable journal. And anybody who does dozy NMR will look at this and say, what? Because apparently we've managed to do an accurate tetra exponential fit here. We've managed to separate four overlapping signals with similar diffusion coefficients. And I'm afraid I don't know of any way in which this published spectrum could have been obtained legitimately. But Let's hope that we never have to deal with that. Here's a second example, again from a reputable journal, in which a biphasic sample, which has got droplets in, was being studied by Dozy using a commercial software package. And here's the Dozy spectrum that was published, the parent Dozy spectrum. And there are two things about this that really ring alarm bells. The first is that it's too good to be true. We have lots of diffusion coefficients that line up absolutely perfectly. We know that if our univariate analysis is giving us statistical uncertainty, that shouldn't happen. And the second is that we have two orders of magnitude of diffusion coefficient here. It's very difficult to get reliable data over such a wide range without using a very wide range of gradient values. So we should be suspicious. If we look at an expansion, then sure enough, what we see is that the software is confidently telling us that we have identical, near identical spectra with similar but distinct diffusion coefficients. And this is a classic example of horrendous overfitting, that the software is being far too ambitious. And it's a black box, but it would appear that it's been programmed to recognize where peaks seem to have similar-ish diffusion coefficients 
and then nail them all down in a line. So not a nice thing to do. Unfortunately, it gets worse. Here's an expansion of the methyl group. And what we see here is that the software has identified a whole series of resolved peaks with different diffusion coefficients, which have then been attributed to different droplet sizes. But if we go back to the raw spectrum, we see that there are no resolved peaks here. Those little segments of signal have all been carved out by the software trying to be helpful, but leading us down the garden path. And what we actually have here is two overlapping signals with different diffusion coefficients, one big, one small. And the result is that as we move across the unresolved profile of the methyl signal, the relative proportions of fast and slow signal are changing, and we get a smooth change in apparent diffusion coefficient that's just the result of two different diffusion coefficients, probably, just from the signal overlap. And we don't have a whole menagerie of different sizes of species. So be very cautious about software that promises you beautiful results. Much better to get an ugly result that you can trust. Now, so far, I haven't really talked about the actual diffusion coefficients, except to say that big things diffuse slowly and small things diffuse rapidly. But I did say that doing really accurate diffusion measurements could be really difficult. That's maybe a little bit too gloomy. Getting a diffusion coefficient to within a couple of percent is well within the range of standard instrumentation and standard methods. But how can we interpret it? I said that the relationship between molecular weight and diffusion coefficient was in some ways an unhelpful one, that a big difference in molecular weight gives us a significantly smaller difference in diffusion coefficient. But suppose that we have a diffusion coefficient and we want to estimate a molecular weight, or suppose we know a molecular weight and we want to estimate a diffusion coefficient. The obvious starting point is the Stokes-Einstein equation, in which we regard a molecule as a ball. Most molecules are a ball to first order. The rate at which our ball diffuses through solution depends on two things, thermal energy kicking it along and viscous drag holding it back. And so we have a balance between energy, thermal energy and viscosity. And the balance is mediated by the hydrodynamic radius how big our species is. And so suppose we take the approximation that all molecules are made of green cheese. So they all have the same density. Then we should be able to rationalize diffusion coefficients. So if we take that approximation, we choose a, a, a suitable density for all molecules. Then disappointingly, what we see is that our ability to correct diffusion coefficients is better for low diffusion, big molecules, and it's better for small solvent molecules. So what's going on here is that the Stokes approximation that molecules are balls moving in a fluid, moving in a continuum solvent, isn't really valid. We have to consider the actual sizes of the solvent molecules, in particular the ratio of the solute hydrodynamic radius to the solvent hydrodynamic radius. But if we do that, then we can actually get a reasonable fit, an analytical relationship that means that we can estimate diffusion coefficients to within 10 or 20%. It's not great, and that corresponds to an uncertainty of up to 50% in molecular weight, but it's still an awful lot better than the Stokes Armstrong model. So this gira theory, the uh, segue method, is finding quite a lot of use. Again, one has to be aware of its limitations, but it does give us fairly good diffusion molecular weight relationships for a very wide range of small molecules, less than about a thousand molecular weight, and solvents.
Of course, we can do much better than this if we pin our problem down. If we say we're only going to look at N-alkanes in deuterochloroform, then we can get a very accurate relationship, but we don't often spend time measuring such systems. Now, one of the big problems in getting reliable diffusion data is that what we really do when we measure diffusion is to measure motion. And if we have coherent as well as random motion, then we've got a problem. So if we look at the dynamics of a single spin, or rather an ensemble of single spins, we've got pre-procession, we've got relaxation, we've got diffusion, but we also have the effect of flow. Now, we might naively think that that shouldn't be a problem. We regulate the temperature in our sample. If the sample's at a uniform temperature, it shouldn't convect. Alas, all NMR samples in liquid state NMR do convect to some extent. Some of them don't do it enough to bother others. Most of them do it enough to be a problem. Typically, liquid flows up one side of the tube and down the other. But what drives it to do that isn't the sort of convection that we see if we um, boil a saucepan of water, for example. Because the common sense view of convection is that it arises when we have warm liquid below cold, and the warm liquid says, I want to be on top. And so we get mixing between hot and cold, upper and lower layers. But if that were all that was going on, then so long as our liquid at the bottom of the sample was colder than the liquid at the top, we get no convection. In practice, if we measure the rate of convection in an NMR sample as a function of what we set the VT to, we find that, yes, there's one temperature at which there's very little convection, but stray from that either above or below, and things still convect. And the reason is that the convection is being driven not by the vertical temperature gradient here, but by a horizontal temperature gradient. Vertical convection, rayleigh bernard convection, is a critical phenomenon. Unless you have a big enough gradient, it doesn't convect. Hadley convection isn't critical, it's always there to some extent. What's the effect? Unfortunately, the effect is that even slow convection gives us a measurable shift in diffusion coefficient. But unfortunately, we don't actually see the uncertainty increasing until we've got really severe convection. So we should always be skeptical about our, about our measured values of D if we haven't taken precautions to either cancel or minimize the effects of convection. Okay, some take home messages. We should think about what we're doing. We should use appropriate methods, both experiment and analysis, preferably tailored to be complementary. We should always be suspicious, bear in mind the limitations. We should always question the assumptions that we're making. Are we really sure there's only one species per peak? Where we've got prior knowledge, if we know there are only three components, use it. If we're going to try something fancy, let's just have a look at the raw data, do a simple HR dosy analysis first, just so that we find out if there's something we should watch out for. And then correct everything in sight. Get your baselines right, minimize line shape variations, correct for the effects of non-uniform gradients, either compensate for convection or use um, a thick walled or even a, a, a narrow bore NMR tube. What not to do? Trust black box software. If you don't know what the algorithm is doing, don't trust it. Be cautious, maybe not too skeptical with the literature, it's 90% true. That's only a little bit worse than most chemical literature. But be very cautious about results that look too good to be true. Right, I'm significantly over time, so I should just finish by thanking all the uh, many people who have been involved in the work I've talked about here, and say that, of course, I would be very happy to answer questions. <laughs>
thank you very much, Professor Morris. That was incredibly informative. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk, and I know that everyone in the audience did as well. Uh, we have several questions already uh, in the Q&A, so I'll get started reading some of them to you. Um, so we have a question here from Ron Wei. Uh, Ron Wei asks, the one-shot dozy spectrum, where the D were all over the place that you showed, was it just a result of signal overlap, such that intermediate values for D were derived? Um, yes. So the, the comparison between the one-shot and the psyche I dozy showed the result of minimizing the signal overlap. And uh, it gave a very nice result. We had no signals that left that were grossly misleading, but we still had to bear in mind that our signals are statistical constructs. And so we have some variation in apparent D between the peaks. Thank you. But yes. Uh, there was actually an early question, earlier question from uh, Jeremy Jean, which, which said, how to deal with overlap peaks in Dozy? And the short answer is, avoid it like the plague. Do everything you can to improve the NMR resolution of your experiment in order to try to avoid signal overlap. Once you've reduced it to a minimum, then you can try doing clever things with high exponential fitting, multivariate analysis, and so on. But work hard to get cleanly resolved NMR signals. Thank you. We have a question from Hao Li. Uh, besides exchangeable protons, would flexibility differences cause varied diffusion coefficients for different segments of a molecule? That's a very nice question because it, it makes us think about orders of magnitude. When we look at diffusion in a room temperature liquid, we should bear in mind the distance scale of the motion. In a, any given dimension, the root mean square displacement of a species with diffusion coefficient d in a time t is the square root of 2 dt. Now, if we put in normal small molecule numbers, what that says is that when we do a diffusion NMR experiment, we're typically looking at displacements of the order of microns, of the order of 10 to the minus 6 meters or more. And that's far bigger than a molecule. So if we have differences in mobility in different parts of any ordinary molecule, they're far too small for us to see with diffusion NMR. But the, the late Paul Callahan did some heroic experiments in which he used absolutely humongous gradients to try to detect the differences in diffusion between the ends of a polymer chain and the middle with, with some success. But it's a very nice question. And I, 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 I'm being a little bit unfair here, but uh, the collaborator whose name I mentioned before the ubiquitin data, but whose name I won't now repeat, actually got into this collaboration because he got up at a conference and said that um, different parts of ubiquitin diffuse at different rates. And uh, there was the sound of a small number of heads hitting desks in front of them from a small number of people in the audience who are actually used to thinking about diffusion NMR. And so we, 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 uh, I'm afraid we mugged him and said, no, no, what you've got there is chemical exchange. And it ended up in it, some very nice experimental data. Thank you. I think that is very helpful. Um, Ryan McKay doesn't have a question. He just says, fantastic talk. Thank you. It's a very nice question. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Ron Wei. Uh, does this mean that the psyche, the psyche I dozy need to be quantitated? Ooh. What do you have to do to achieve this? Right. Uh, so that's a whole uh, that's that, that's a whole new um, consumer advocates talk. One of the commonest questions about pure shift NMR methods in general is: Are they quantitative? And the answer is always, well, it depends what you mean by quantitative. Now, what we want here is for the psyche experiment to be quantitative in the sense that if we do the same experiment with different gradient values, do the results that we get attenuate as they should do as a function of gradient squared? The answer to that is absolutely. If you were to look at any individual one of those psyche spectra and say, is the integral of the methyl three times that the integral of a methane signal, the answer would be not usually, 
So in terms of, quanti of relative quantitation within a spectrum, pure shift methods are problematic. There are ways to get really good quantitative data, but they're pretty hard work. But quantitative in the sense that you can do dozy with it, absolutely. So in, in fact, uh, we first started working on pure shift, shift NMR methods precisely because we wanted to use them in DOSI to get the extra resolution. So there are no special precautions needed to be taken with pure shift DOSI compared to uh, other sorts of DOSI, except that you need a bit more patience because you need to allow for the lower sensitivity. Thank you. We have a question from Julia Cassani. Do you suggest to analyze the spectra with different commercial programs in light of this issue where they can sometimes give incorrect results? I did say that I advocated using software that you understood, where you knew what it was doing. I certainly say it's a good idea to compare different methods. Now, that may be different methods, different algorithms offered by the same software package, or it may be a comparison with different commercial software packages. Or if, if I can uh, change my hat for a moment and be a salesman, then th there is the general NMR analytical toolbox, the, the NAT, which is free software, it used to be called the DOZY toolbox. And that has got a lot of different DOZY analysis and multivariate analysis methods built in. So th there are quite a lot of different flavors of software out there. Try compare results, and always bear in mind how Dozy can mislead us. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Antonio Marquis. Can you comment on using Dozy to study high molecular weight polymers with high poly dispersity? We're back with this Stratos tragedy here, with the difficulty of disentangling overlapping exponentials because what we're usually asking dozy to do here is to take a spectrum in which a given peak has got a wide range of different molecular weights but there's no difference in the nmr spectrum between the different polymers if you've got slightly different chemical shifts you've got much more chance but if everything is absolutely overlapped then it's a really difficult problem classic ways to look at this are programs like like contin um, we've had a little bit of success with neural networks, but not very much. But you absolutely need to bear in mind that you are trying something very difficult. The first thing is to say that you must calibrate the spatial variation of your gradients carefully if you are to be able to get anything reliable in the way of um, a diffusion coefficient distribution or even more difficult, a molecular weight distribution out of dosing measurements. If I were a polymer chemist rather than an NMR spectroscopist, I would be uh, very cautious and I would want to triangulate. I would never trust a single measurement modality unless I were desperate. And so I would want to compare the results of um, dosing, GPC, and light scattering, where all three are possible because they have very different biases. DOSI works by NMR, in which one proton gives us one proton worth of signal. And so the relative contribution that a given species makes to the NMR signal is proportional to its molecular weight and its concentration. At light scattering, on the other hand, we have a very, very strong bias towards larger aggregates. And so with light scattering, you'll always get an answer that's biased towards the heavier species. NMR, it's much less reliable, but it gives you a less biased result. So, yes, that, that's a, a really difficult area. There are things that can be done, and some people have had some success, but it needs very, very good experimental hygiene. Yes. We have several more questions. They're pouring in. Your talk was uh, was has sparked a lot of discussion. No, I we also question... took for too long. We have a question here from Callum Gator. Uh, thank you for the talk, Gareth. It was very informative and useful. 
Does aggregation come into play with confusing diffusion coefficients if your sample likes to cluster in solution for whatever reason? Absolutely. Absolutely. When we were calibrating the Segway method, we stupidly included um, one, two propandiol as one of the small molecules we used for calibration and speedily realized that it was an outlier because one, two propandiol tends to dimerize in solution to hydrogen bonding. So anything that aggregates is going to diffuse more slowly. And uh, DOZI is used quite a lot to study aggregation. Going back to the polymer problem, it's not good at disentangling arbitrary distributions of different aggregate sizes, but we've often used it to tell whether something is a monomer, a dimer, or a trimer. We have a question from Jennifer. Thank you very much, Professor. Is it better to launch, this is a practical question, is it better to launch DOZI manually or to uh, adjust, or just to launch it automatically, maybe by adjusting certain parameters? In the... Right, so, so we're talking about topspin here, and the question yes. is, should we optimize the gradient pulse width and the uh, diffusion delay, and also, of course, uh, the uh, range of gradient amplitudes, or should we just accept what topspin gives us? And a lot depends on what our sample is and what our requirements are. If we have a fairly standard sample with well dispersed diffusion coefficients, Brooker's defaults will be fine. If we have a very wide range of diffusion coefficients, then we might want to change the default distribution of gradient values that we use. If we have molecules that are particularly small, we might want to reduce our diffusion or attenuation. Otherwise, the last 10 spectra we measure will have no signal. Or if we've got large molecules, we may want to decrease the attenuation so that, oh, sorry, increase the attenuation so that we do see a measurable change in signal as we vary our gradient amplitude. Again, if we have a problem where we know there's overlap and we think we might want to use by exponential fitting or multivariate analysis, then we want to make sure that we get a good range of diffusion attenuation and we also need very good signal to noise ratio. So it very much depends on the sample. For uh, routine samples, routine parameters are fine. But if we're dealing with a difficult problem or if signal to noise is a real problem, then it's often worth spending just five or 10 minutes to optimize the conditions. I think the question talked about attenuating to 10%. That's, that's a useful rule of thumb. That will work fine for most purposes. But if you're wanting to do by exponential fitting, or if you're wanting to disentangle very similar diffusion coefficients, you probably want to go further than that. Equally, if you're very short of signal to noise ratio, then you may want to um, maximize, but you may want to increase, shall we say, the gradient pulse width and decrease D20 to reduce relaxation losses, particularly true if you've got a quadrupolar nucleus or you've got rapid relaxation for some reason. And because signal to noise ratio is so important, it's often worth taking the extra trouble to find the experimental parameters that give us the best signal to noise ratio coupled with the right range of signal attenuation. So a complicated answer to a simple question. But, but very helpful, I think, thank you. We have an interesting question from Anas. Uh, Anas asks, uh, says the, the inverse Laplace transforms are ambiguous, but can methods using some regularization be trusted, at least to conservatively estimate the number of different D values before applying methods that you, the other, the other methods that you explained? Yes, again, a, a, an interesting and complicated question. The purist answer is absolutely not. But the pragmatist's answer is, well, yes, content, uh, content can be useful. Content values smoothness. Content says, what is the smooth distribution of signal as a function of diffusion coefficient 
that gives us the lowest residual. And it can be useful. And if, for example, you have um, two species with very different molecular masses, I think years ago I made up a, um, a test data set for, for Varian when we, when we wrote the DOSI software for VNMRJ. And that included a sample that had some uh, uh, high molecular weight dextran and some low molecular weight sugars. And we could put that data into Contin and Contin would come back and say, you've got a peak at high molecular weight, a low diffusion coefficient, and a peak at low molecular weight, high diffusion coefficient. Under the right circumstances, Contin can tell you the numbers of different Ds. If the number is two, and if the Ds are very different. But because Contin has, because of the limits of exponential analysis, to give us a very smooth result, it's not at all good at picking up populations with diffusion coefficients that aren't very different. If, on the other hand, you can compare Contin with other methods, sometimes you can work out what's going on. There are also, of course, other regularization methods, and uh, different groups have their own favored approaches to this. But I would be very cautious about trusting the result. You would regard it as evidence to be weighed rather than an answer. We have a question from uh, Ali. I am a polymer chemist. I do dozy for, uh, for polymers to know the number of populations. I observe that the chain ends are often on a different level compared to the polymer backbone. What do you think could be the cause of such an issue? Uh, I'm sorry to say that I think that it is almost certainly a problem with the relationship between experiment and data analysis rather than any true difference in diffusion. So I, I talked earlier about Paul Callahan's heroic work looking at very high polymers. On uh, with, with normal lab equipment, even with a diff probe, it's simply not possible for us to measure differences in mobility between different parts of a polymer with molecular weight a million, 10 million, or whatever. Now, I mentioned the problem of baseline correction, that small errors in baseline can make a significant difference in apparent diffusion coefficient. Without seeing data, I can't be sure, but if I had to guess, I would say that the simplest explanation for seeing end groups with different apparent diffusion coefficients to main chain resonances is that there is a small baseline error. And as a result, the difference, the change in the apparent diffusion coefficient of the weak chain end signals is far greater than the change in the strong main chain signals, simply because the baseline is a much smaller fraction for the main chain signals. So I, I have to guess that here the problem is likely to be one of, of baseline correction or some other systematic error rather than any real difference in diffusion coefficient. So we're, we are well past the, the hour at this point. Uh, I'd like to ask Professor Morris, do you have time to answer a few more questions or how, how does your schedule look? No, 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 no problem. I don't have to cook dinner until six o'clock. Well, uh, well, we'll ask a few more questions here since there are so many more interesting questions that people are putting into the Q&A, uh, if that's all right. Sure, no problem. So we have a question here from uh, Maria Victoria Gomez. In a concentration-dependent experiment, where one wants to measure D of a sample as a function of concentration, uh, what do you do about the variation of viscosity with concentration? How do you consider that? What's the best method? Have you been deliberately trying to get interesting questions for this talk? Okay, so that's that's another Lulu, that is. Well, the short answer, of course, is that when we measure D, we don't take viscosity into account at all. When we measure D, we hope that what we're measuring really is the diffusion coefficient. 
Now, of course, the subtext of the question is that if we want to know what the effect of solute concentration is, but take out the effect of the changes in the bulk medium through which we're diffusing, that's more difficult. Now, one way to do this, of course, is to take all your samples and put them in a falling ball viscometer or something and actually measure the viscosity. Problem is that the viscosity that is experienced by a molecule trying to diffuse through a fluid is not the same as the viscosity that we measure macroscopically by dropping a ball or whatever. And so macroscopic measurements of viscosity aren't really going to help. It's microviscosity that matters. So I'll turn the question around and say it really depends what you want to know about. If you want to know about the possibility of aggregation, for example, then one way to take out the effect of microviscosity is to add a small amount of a reference compound with a simple spectrum that doesn't overlap and that is of a similar size and chemical nature to the system of interest, and then look not at the absolute diffusion coefficient, but the ratio of the diffusion coefficient to your calibrant molecule. And then you can pick out the concentration dependence from the variation in the medium. If you're working at, at very high concentration and you can't uh, use a calibrant, then another possibility is to estimate the obstruction effects. The primary reason why very concentrated solutions show slower diffusion than dilute solutions is not actually the macroscopic viscosity. It's the solute molecules, the diffusing molecules, banging into each other, being obstructed by each other. And there are theories for those obstruction effects and a good, a, a simple approximation is that the diffusion coefficient scales as one minus the solute mole fraction divided by two. So a, 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 an interesting question here, and it depends very much what you want to do with the results. We have a question from Lucio Friedman. Thanks for a great enlightening talk. Thanks, Lucio. I think he knows all this stuff. We have a question from an anonymous attendee. Aliphatic and aromatic protons within the same molecule have sometimes different apparent diffu diffusion coefficients. Is this related to the different T1 relaxation time, or is this related to other things that you've already talked about with regarding baseline and things like that? No, in a well-conducted experiment, the relaxation has no effect on the measured diffusion coefficient. If we see different apparent diffusion coefficients for aliphatic and aromatic signals, then it means that we have systematic error present. Now, in a conventional dose experiment like, like one shot, where the uh, signal attenuation is the same irrespective of chemical shift, then it usually comes down to baseline correction. If we're doing um, Pure shift experiments, like for example, a Zangersteck dose, a Zangersteck dose experiment, then those are actually spatially resolved, and we can see differences in apparent diffusion coefficient as a function of chemical shift, because the actual gradient strength varies with position in the sample. And the answer there is to use um, non-uniform gradient calibration. But normally, no, we we shouldn't see different diffusion coefficients for the same molecule. Right. We have a question from uh, Michael Respond Respondek, and I think that this might this will have to be our last question because we're done so far past our, the hour. Uh, but Michael asks, "Thank you, Professor Gareth, for a great talk. I have a practical question. What type of sample do you recommend for calibrating gradient strength of pulse field gradients?" Yeah, that's a good one to finish on. The sample is less important than the method. The, the short answer is that when I'm calibrating gradients, I normally use um, a, a 1% H2O in D2O sample because uh, there are some excellent temperature-dependent calibrant values there um, in the literature. 
However, if, for example, we wanted to um, calibrate an experiment for doing high molecular, high molecular weight polymers, then we would have to use relatively uh, wide gradient pulses. We would need to get a lot of diffusion on attenuation, so we might even use five or 10 millisecond gradient pulses. And then the difficulty is that our um, diffusion calibration, our gradient calibration, is going to vary slightly with the gradient pulse width. The reason is, as I mentioned, gradient coils have limited dynamic performance. So when we ask for a gradient pulse, it doesn't just switch on straight away. It switches on gradually and switches off gradually. The wider the pulse is, the less the rise and fall time matters. So a 10 millisecond gradient pulse gives a slightly greater area than a one millisecond pulse. So if we wanted to do our gradient calibration for high molecular weight experiments using 10 millisecond pulses, we would either want to use a slowly diffusing calibrant, or we would want to do an experiment on a low molecular weight like um, H2O and D2O, but with the same gradient pulse widths and therefore much, much weaker gradients. Now that's fine if our electronics is squeaky clean, but certainly in the early days, manufacturers sometimes used diode boxes to try to chop off gradient amplifier noise. And that meant that they gave unreliable gradient amplitudes at very low nominal gradients. So as usual, the answer depends on what you want to do. But what do I do? I use, D I use H2O and D2O.